Well, guys, welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. I'm glad that you're all here as we go through the book of Romans. Today, we're going to be in chapter 10. Paul is going to break down for us uh, the essence of his heart for people. And uh, I think it's worth us looking at. So if those of you would with me, just uh, pray with me. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be with our brothers and sisters in you and that you have given us this sense of connectedness and oneness with one another and this desire to share our lives with one another and to hear about other people's lives. Lord, we thank you for the love that you've put in our hearts that we wouldn't have otherwise. And because you're in our lives, we have that. We're grateful, Lord. I thank you for this family that we have here, Grace, and for all that you're doing. And we just pray that you would work in us that which is pleasing to you this morning. That as we look at your word, as we allow it to saturate our souls, that your spirit would speak to us, that you might help us to understand something more of how we could be for you and how we might be molded more into the image of Jesus Christ. I thank you for everyone that's come, uh, it's taken their time and, and it's taken a step out the door to be here. I pray that you might watch over us, Lord, and guard us, protect us, and as we're here, that we might hear your voice and not be distracted. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so welcome to chapter 10. I pulled verse 13 out, and it says, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can I get an amen? amen. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. And of course, that's, that's Christian lingo. You know, the rest of the world doesn't understand what that is. You know, they understand saving and investment in a completely different light. Um, but being saved is something that only God can do for our souls. It's not something we can do for ourselves or anyone else can do for you. Uh, so praise God for that. So as we look into chapter 10, just to remind you, where we are in the book. We are in chapter 10, right in the middle of Israel's past, present, and future. So we'll talk about their present, and, and Paul's going to share some things from his heart. Beginning in verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, the man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks this way, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith in which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Amen. Now, how many of you don't understand parts of this? Oh, I'm so glad I have a job. <laughs> Praise God. No, I mean, the day I look and everyone understands is when I, I just pulled the wrong message and I need to form another one instantly. But good, we're going to look at this declared righteousness. By the way, you know, righteousness is something that invariably throughout the world, everyone believes is something that you manufacture. Righteousness is something that you can boast of since you manufacture it, right? We use terms like uh, bad boy and good boy, which is, in, I don't want to go into the damage, but righteousness, most people believe righteousness is doing right things, 
And that's a good definition. But unfortunately, we think we are the very source of goodness in which all those good things get done. And so when I do a good thing, I sense pride. I gave my tithe today, pastor. I just thought I'd show you or let you know. You know, there's a righteous thing. And, and you, you want to be seen doing righteous things. You don't want to be seen doing unrighteous things, right? You, you want to sneak those things. You know, if you're doing something you know you're not supposed to be doing. Or if you're going over the speed limit, you know, you're watching out for the cops. You don't ever want to get caught doing that. But when you're doing something righteous, like when you're doing the speed limit and there's a cop, you're like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> we, are, we are built in such a way that we believe that righteousness is us doing good and everyone should see it. And yet when we're doing something unrighteous, we need to hide that so that people don't see who we truly are. And the whole world does this. And it doesn't matter what culture you come from or what state you live in or what country. This is the way that we are. And the same thing happened in Jesus' time with the Pharisees. They got on board with God's law. And this is God's intent. This is, this is what I'd like you to do. Here it is. I'm putting it out. These are my requirements. And everybody said, no problem, Lord, I got this. No problem, I got this, really? Really? People think that they can do everything that God wants them to do, and we can't. I don't know about you, but the giant struggle of most people is shame and guilt. Shame of things that I've done that I can't undo, and I'm bearing the weight of it upon myself, and guilt that, that I'm broken and I, there's no fix in me. That's the greatest thing that's facing mankind. And the way that we do it is we try to overcompensate with these wonderful scales that we have imagined in heaven. That if I just do more good things than I do bad things, I know God will accept me and I'll be good enough. Well, God has already told us what good enough is and he showed it to us in his son. And none of us rises to that. So as we talk about righteousness and we talk about Israel and we talk about what it is to understand who Christ is and what Christ's righteousness is, it's important that we come at it and we understand what the pit is in which God pulled us out of and the tendencies we have within ourselves to think of just that word righteousness. I think it's when I do good things and I'm entitled to let everyone know with a trumpet. Or maybe if I'm on stage in front of a light, I can tell everybody all my good things. It's a temptation for all of us, isn't it? Because we want to be accepted. We want to be loved. And we want other people to say, hey, you're good, even though you know you're not. Well, I'm going off on a tangent. Forgive me. <laughs> we haven't even gotten started. Forgive me. <laughs> Verse 1. Paul says, brethren... He's talking to fellow Christians. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel's that they may be saved. Wow. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. He says this earlier in chapter 9 when he began the chapter. He said, I tell the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who were Israelites. To whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom the fathers and of whom according to the flesh Christ came, who was over all and the eternally blessed God. Amen. So Paul talks about this deep desire he has in his heart for his countrymen, for those where he came out of. Remember, Paul at this point is called Paul, and he's a Christian. He is somebody who follows the Messiah. And he says, I, I wish these guys would get it. The reason I wish they could get it is because, man, they really have a zeal. They've got, they've got some energy. You know, they seem to want to do what God wants them to do. And, boy, you've got to appreciate that about somebody, right? Mm -hmm. Even if they're incredibly deceived, they're certainly zealous. And it seems as though they really want to know God. And, my goodness, the, the people from Israel certainly have 
it made because God disclosed himself through Abraham and through all of his descendants to them. What a, what a great thing. And he says, my great desire is that they might get saved. I read that and I feel so unqualified to be a pastor because his desire is that they get saved. And we see him go from town to town to town and he gets beat up and he was taken for dead. He was stoned. He was beaten with rods. He, he was shipwrecked. All of these things. And he continued to go and share the gospel because of this deep desire, this deep love he had for his people. And it's not prejudice. Paul went to the Jews. Saul went to the Jews and the Jews rejected him. He goes, well, the Lord spoke to me. I got to go to the Gentiles now because <laughs> you guys aren't listening. I told you and told you and told you and I told you that I told you and now I'm telling you, I told you. And that's it. And he kicks the dust from his feet and he moves on. He talks to the Gentiles and people get saved like this because they, they know they need a savior. They're not all wrapped up in their own righteousness, which is one of the benefits of being super broken. You know you're broken. And so he says, my deep desire is for them to be saved. Where did Jesus find you? I mean, I don't know. I look out and I know some of you. And I know where the Lord found you. But where did the Lord find you? He found me as a drug-addicted, rebellious, insolent, cocky, I got a thousand other words, but that suffices. <laughs> And he saved me and he showed me his love even where I was. Even while I was still yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And it melted my heart. And he opened my eyes. And so now that I'm a Christian, I look at my people who aren't the Jewish people. I look at my people who are the drug-addicted, insolent, rebellious, foul-mouthed, arrogant. Those are my people. Just as much the Israelites are. Paul's people. Does my heart break for them? Is, is it my deep desire that they get saved? You know, sometimes I can get so tangled up in my own life, I don't care. Not like this. I don't pray faithfully. Not, not like he is. What a great example to me. Who are your people? You know, you may have been a jock. You may have grown up and doing athletics in school and that kind of thing. Do you have a deep desire that those people come to know Jesus? If, if you're Italian of Italian descent and you, and you know what the meal of the fishes is and all of that, like, do you have a desire for those people to come to know Jesus Christ? And as a biker, do you have a heart for the people who are bikers who don't know Jesus Christ? If you're a scholastic, if you went to Oxford, if you, if there, by chance there's anyone here, uh, Cambridge or anywhere else, a person of high learning and you, you searched all the corners of the universe and you thought about philosophy and psychology and, you know, human interaction and sociology and you've been informed. And Do you have a heart for those people who are just incredibly deceived because of what they've been indoctrinated into in a college? Is it your deep desire to see your people, whoever they are? And by the way, there's not a problem with having a people. As long as you don't exclude all other people, which there are people that do that. They have a special ministry to a special select group with people that only have blue eyes and red hair or, <laughs> or, or something or come from a particular part of the world and that's it. I don't talk to you if you're from somewhere else. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about having a deep desire to be used by God to take the things that he's brought you through to bring them to know Jesus Christ. We can get so tied up with our lives and so infected with junk that we don't feel God's heart. He says... I bear them witness that they have zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. And see, I don't even look at my own screen. What's wrong with me? <laughs> Identity with the lost ignites a passion to see the lost rescued. And so who are your people? Consider that. 
Who are your people? Who has God called you to? And by the way, he's called you to somebody. He's called you somewhere. He says that they have zeal. You know what zeal is, right? Zeal is that great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. It's like a, a wonderful, marvelous horse that can run like the wind, darting for a cliff. <laughs> That's what enthusiasm is. That's what zeal is without knowledge. I'm going as fast as I can in one direction, not realizing that the ground is about to fall out from beneath me. And Paul says this of the Jews. He says, I, I pray for them and my earnest desire is for them to get saved because they want to know God. They, they have a zeal for God. I mean, certainly not all of them, but as a people, you would, you would not say, hey, here's a bunch of lazy people. I mean, they, they stand in front of a wall, and I mean, there's all kinds of things that they have to do, and these <laughs> folks are zealous to know God. And guess what? You know him. You know him personally. You know something they don't know, and they'll never achieve by all the things they do. What a tremendous privilege God has given you and I to share the knowledge of Jesus Christ with people. They have this great enthusiasm. He says, I bear them witness that they, may, that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Zeal is like a really big hammer. <laughs> and yet, you can always hit the wrong nail. I, I don't know if you've ever done this. That's what zeal without knowledge is. It's incredible force and energy directed but misdirected. And it's an amazing thing how one part of your body can control all the other parts. And then you get what's known as a hematoma. Any of you know what a hematoma is? It's a hematoma. And the funny thing is it shows up on fingers, it shows up on toes. Uh, it's only if you try holding a nail with your toe. So don't do that. It doesn't work well. But zeal without knowledge is like a hammer but missing the mark. And it doesn't do the constructive thing it's supposed to do. It does a destructive thing, which you never intended it to do. And it will take you months to grow that nail out. That's what zeal without knowledge is. You know, there's, there's a couple of combinations here that could be lethal. One is to have zeal without knowledge. We know what that leads to. But what is it to have knowledge without zeal? What is it to know and yet not do? Or what is it to know but not really take it seriously and put some gas into it? That's a horrible thing too, isn't it? Zeal and knowledge, boy, there's a, there's a good combo to have. That's somebody you want on your team, right? That's somebody you want to hire, somebody you want to be friends with. That's somebody who's really serious about what they say, and there's some unction behind them. That's what you want. So zeal without knowledge, he says, I can tell you, these guys got zeal without knowledge. And Christians are funny because I can only imagine how some Jews may see Christians. Oh, so it's the birthday of the Messiah. Who's this dude? <laughs> he's the Mashiach of Israel, really? And you got some dude in a red suit with a white beard, and he's... Really? And that's what Christian zeal sometimes looks like to the Jew. You ever thought about that? How Christianity looks from the outside? This is what they think. And, of course, there are all sorts of mixed messages that get put in there. And if people want to mock your Christianity, all they have to do is pretend to be Santa. Here's the point. Sometimes Christian zeal looks like not Jesus at all. Sometimes it looks like you pounding out your own particular preference and trying to get Jesus to authorize your own opinion. And so we have to be careful that we don't get that way. 
Because it can happen in a church where zeal, you can get zeal for like church attendance. Where is everybody? Is everybody afraid to die? What's going on? Okay, that's zeal, but not understanding God wants a cheerful giver and you don't force that. Or, or, or pounding your fist on a, on a pulpit and talking about money and everybody should give a second and third and fourth offering. Pfft, we'll never do that. Because it can happen in a church where you have zeal without knowledge. So I don't want to be too critical and say, yeah, that's right. You, you guys over there, you, you, don't, you got zeal, but you ain't got no knowledge. I don't want to be that way because it can happen to us. And I want to be careful that it doesn't happen here. Jesus mentions in chapter 7 of Matthew, verses 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many number, wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, that's what it is to have zeal without knowledge. Jesus said, I never knew you. It's possible to be zealous about doing a lot of things and yet missing the very object, the very person for whom you do those things. It's just like anything. You can get caught up in a marriage just doing the right things and you forget why you do them. Oh, yeah, I love that person, don't I? I almost forgot that. Can you see how hollow that existence is? That's a righteousness that you manufacture as opposed to one that is inspired. This is a very different thing. So either you are striving in your life for happiness or holiness. You can, you can be striving for happiness, and pretty much that's in our Constitution, isn't it? I have a right. I have a right to pursue happiness. And yet, is that really what God wants us to do, is pursue happiness? Because if that's what you're pursuing, you'll never get it. And yet, the Lord, I believe, calls us to holiness, which involves a relationship. It involves a surrender. It involves, uh, Lord, what would you have me do? Instead of... I'm going to do this because I like it. I want this. I want that. I want the other thing. And then we think that it's our right to be happy. And, and what the Lord wants is not all of the ritual, but he wants relationship. And we can get caught up in that. Am I, am I preaching to the choir here or what? Or is it only me? I can get caught up in a, well, you know, I got, I got, I got to prepare a sermon and put it together. I can do it. God help me if I do that, I should be fired. But it's not about ritual, it's about relationship. Sometimes we get over anxious about activity and what we neglect is intimacy. And so we'll be all up and about doing things and yet there isn't any real right motive in our heart for it. And I think we need to be careful that we don't become like Israel where we understand all these things about God and so, okay, all there is to do is just do it, but the relationship is gone. Verse three, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes? You see, when Jesus came and hung on the cross and he said, it is finished, he performed the law perfectly. He did that because he knows you wouldn't be able to. And really, that's God's only acceptable measure is that you get 100% on the test. And none of us makes 100% on the test. But Jesus did. So what you say is, ah, I don't need your help. I'll get this. And we fail. Doesn't matter how many you miss. Even if you miss one, you fail. So trying to understand what God's intention is behind the law and trying to perform the law so that you're good enough are two different things. And if you're not careful, you can get stuck with law keeping. 
And I think that's what he's talking about here. This righteousness that they're ignorant of is not that they didn't know the scriptures. It's that they got caught up thinking that if I do enough, then God will love me enough. And it happens to everybody. I love this little cartoon. A little girl with a little, little bear and Jesus is asking her to give the bear up. And she says, but I love this God. And he says, trust me, I have better for you. And you see, that's what it's like. Jesus performs the, the, the law perfectly. And he's saying, listen, I'm willing to give you my test and you can hand it in for yourself. And it's not illegal because his father's the one grading it. Accepting a free gift from God Accepting righteousness, which has been declared to us as an inheritance, is a much different thing than trying to manufacture some. And when you know that it's a gift that God gives you and he sees you as righteous and he sees you as holy because he looks through his son Jesus Christ, is something that changes us to live a life for him that's acceptable to him because we do it from a heart of love and thanks and not from an obligative I've got to do this. Oh, I can't believe it. Which nobody wants, right? How would, you, how would you like to invite your son or daughter over for lunch and they come and they're like, oh, I can't believe it. They left their phone on. They didn't know it. And then you get to hear all their conversation in the car. It's like, I can't believe it. I got to go over to their house. And so they're probably going to talk about their aches and pains and blah, 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 I don't want to hear it. <laughs> they never listen to me. They never want to know about me. Blah, 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 blah. And then they walk in the house and then you're like, I had no idea you felt that way. <laughs> we can get that way with God when we don't spend time with him, when we don't look into his word, when we don't spend time on our knees in fellowship with him, when we don't think that the people of God are important enough to make a phone call to or to spend time with. Our relationship suffers. And yet God has something better for us. And if we do what he says, things work out extremely well. In Philippians 3, verses 3 to 9, Paul explaining some things to us. He says, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. He's about to start boasting rhetorically, sarcastically. It's everywhere in the Bible. If anyone thinks he has confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. Circumcised on the eighth day. By the way, it's the perfect day. Circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel. Definitely the people you want to belong to. The tribe of Benjamin. Benjamites have a lot to be proud of. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, as far as the law of God, I was a Pharisee, which is the strictest, most um, strictest sect. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. In other words, anybody who stood against what he believed about God, you were going down. Concerning the righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. He said, there was no one who could point their finger at me and say I did anything wrong. Really? I can't get away five minutes without that. <laughs> but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God by faith. The Apostle Paul, having come from a perfect upbringing, a perfect demonstration, what he ends up doing is saying, all of this was nothing. I thought it was everything. I poured my life into this. I took incredible amount of pride. And you can hear him as he's sarcastically telling you, you got pride? Well, I got some pride. Let me tell you about me. And he says, it's nothing. I would much rather have the righteousness of Christ than my own righteousness. 
which is faulty, although it may look all good on the outside. And that is the difference between Christianity and every other religion. Either you are accepting the righteousness of Jesus Christ and him alone by faith, or you are trying to make your own way to heaven, which is completely impossible. You can't make it there. You can't get there in a rocket ship. You can't get there in an Oldsmobile. <laughs> you can't get there by running. You can't get there except through having faith in the finished work of what Jesus did on the cross. Amen? Amen. Okay. Verse 5, proving the point about righteousness, it doesn't come from us. Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. So what you have is a choice. You are either going to choose to live according to the law and have to stand before God and give a, an account for what you've done. Or you will accept what Jesus did on account of you. And you have a choice. And that's it. I, I, the Jesus stuff. I don't need that Jesus stuff. Ever had any people tell you that? I don't need the Jesus stuff. I, I'm good enough. Are you really? You don't believe that. How did you know? Because the Bible says so. The Bible said that about me? Yeah, it said that about you. You're not good enough. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How did, wow. What did, all right, well, tell me more about your Jesus then. Galatians 3.10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do all the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. If you say, I am a good law keeper, I'm a good person, well, then the standard is perfection. No problem. You can get to heaven on your own as long as you're perfect. You're under a curse. If you're a law keeper, you're under a curse. And it can happen to us. You want to be careful it doesn't infiltrate your own life. Because we start thinking about the scales. Well, you know, I went to church last week. Really, I don't need to go this week. I, I went last week, so the good side's pretty good. And then you do some rotten things, and you go, oh, I'd better get to church. <laughs> and it's legalism. It's bondage. It's not the voice of God. Well, it, I was pretty mean to her yesterday. I better buy her flowers. That's, I'm just saying. That gets me out of everything. I'm just saying. <laughs> You're going to have to stand before the judge and give an account. And God knows everything. Judge Judy knows many things, but God knows everything. It says in James chapter 2, verses 8 to 13, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, that's Leviticus 19, 18. If you're really a good law keeper and you're keeping the law, here's one. You do well, but if you show partiality, you commit sin. In other words, you have to love everybody equally. You can't love some people more and, and other people less and, and be angry at other people. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. If you break the law, you've broken the law. It doesn't matter how many you kept. It matters how many you broke. And there's always one. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. He also said, love your neighbor as yourself, by the way. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, then you've become a transgressor of the law. Well, that's understandable. If you're a murderer, you transgress the law. Of course you did. What about if you don't love your neighbor? That's what he's saying. If you're a keeper of the law and you obey Leviticus 19, 18, you love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know, I, I took a shower this morning and put on clean clothes. Did you do that for your neighbor? I had a delicious cup of coffee. Did you do that for your neighbor? Do, do you see how instantly <laughs> I'm a sinner? I don't treat people as well as I treat myself. And we're all like that. So, Speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, which is God's grace. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy 
triumphs over judgment. Amen. That means I will be judged by what Jesus did and not judged by the things I have done. That's what it is to be a Christian. Jesus Christ is my Lord. He's my Savior. He's my boss. He tells me what to do, and I do it. Do you do it perfectly? No. But thank God he's not keeping score. But what he is doing is changing my heart every single day, all the time. And that's the experience of what it is to be a Christian. Verse 6, but the righteousness of faith speaks this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. How many of you are confused by this Old Testament passage? Oh, I'm so glad. So I thought I would go to Deuteronomy 30, which is what he's quoting, because if you were a good Jew, you might know this passage, but you don't. Deuteronomy 30, verses 11, 14, this is what Moses said. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you and is not far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. It's one of those, hmm. It's very curious. Moses is saying, the thing I'm going to tell you isn't so difficult you can't understand it. And it's not so untouchable that it's in some faraway land that you have to go there to attain it. Because what kind of a God would that be who says, I've got some secrets, but you'll never know them. I've got some way which I'd like you to be, but you can't get there because it's only found in India at the top of a mountain. And if you sit in a certain position and you say, I'm a million times and don't eat for a month. What kind of a God would that be? It's not mysterious or unknowable. God's will is not mysterious or unknowable. And you know, there are people that, that you'll have a conversation with and they're like, well, nobody can really know about God. You ever had people say that? says, it's not so unknowable. God is noble. You can know him. Absolutely. And if you know him, you know that's true. Do you know that you know him? He's completely knowable. And he's not distance, and it's not a perilous thing to find. So you don't need to drop acid to get in touch with God. You don't need to go to India and sit on a mountain. It's not far away, and it's not unknowable. It's simple. In fact, it's so simple that little children say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's what faith is. It's just that simple. A child could understand it. And aren't you glad? It's not like explaining physics to a child. This is salvation. This is the righteousness that God says. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, as we just saw. And that is the word of faith in which we preach. In Luke 17, 20 to 21, it says, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he, meaning Jesus, answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. You see, the scriptures teach us that we come to a personal knowledge of who God is through Jesus Christ. And it's not something that happens over there or over here. And it doesn't take great feats to be able to be qualified for God to speak to you. It just takes somebody willing to humble themselves and saying, God, I need a savior. Make sense? John chapter one, verses one to five and verse 14. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing has been made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not comprehended it or has not overtaken it. And the word 
became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, God has come down so that you don't have to go up there to meet him. He has also been risen up from the abyss. He has actually been risen from the dead. And so that you don't have to go there either. Jesus did it for you. He did all of it. So you don't need to ascend into the heavens. You don't need to go to the depths or the other uttermost parts of the sea. Jesus came and is the word. He is God incarnate so that we might know him. What a blessed thing God did for us. We owe him everything. But what does it say? He's near to you. In John 16, 13. Whoever, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you of things to come. Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit, which would be sent unto us upon his ascension, which came at Pentecost, says that the spirit of God will come and he will teach you. You know what I'm talking about? God is not so far away. He's right here with you. Because Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be with you. And he'll never leave you or forsake you, by the way. And what Jesus says about himself is also true of the Holy Spirit. It is said in Ephesians that the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So you don't have to worry about losing God. It's, it's interesting. You hear stories of people who at one time had a zealous faith and yet they have wandered away and you wonder what's going on. I, I heard one preacher liken it unto a dock and a boat that was tethered to the dock. Most people think that they are the dock and that God is the boat and that you have to, you know, you have to pull the boat in. If you want to be near God, you have to do that. But what it is, is you're the boat. God's the dock. Because God doesn't move. We drift, but he does not. It also says of John, uh, in John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. You got a question you can't be answered? Don't ask the pastor. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Are you having trouble with your memory? Don't ask your pastor. So the, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to be a counselor to come alongside. He's the paraclete. That's the word that's used in the Greek. He comes alongside of us. He's kind of the counselor. He's the guy who's your uh, attorney. It's actually the same word. And he comes alongside and he teaches us and he brings to remembrance everything that Jesus has said. The only way that the Holy Spirit can bring something up is if you put it in. You will not be able to remember John 3.16 if you've never read it. And the Holy Spirit has no way of bringing something up that's never been put in. And I find the more that I learn, the more that I read the word, the more he brings it to my remembrance. And I think, why don't I have a toolbox loaded with scriptures for him to bring up? Wouldn't we do ourselves a favor? Wouldn't it be easier? In the midst of struggling through things and I don't have an answer, I know God does have an answer and it's probably in his word and the Holy Spirit would love it to, to bring it to my remembrance, but I never read it. So I can't remember it, which is why I love my job more than anything, more than any other job I've ever had, because I get to put God's word in and put it in and put it in. And then I have to cut it down so I don't kill you guys. First John 2.27 says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you and you do not need that anyone teach you. See, I'm out of a job. 
But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has been taught to you, you will abide in him. You will abide in him. The spirit of God, because he's in you, will cause you to be in him. Otherwise, we would just be loose cannons. We'd be lost. We'd be like the boat untied from the dock and just drifting. But I thank God that we're not, that the Holy Spirit of God makes a difference in our lives because we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth that, Jesus, that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Do you believe that? It's about confessing. By the way, the word confess is not necessarily telling somebody all your sins. To confess means to agree with. If you confess the Lord Jesus Christ, it says that you're agreeing with the Lord Jesus Christ. It means I agree. When you feel convicted, you know you did something wrong, and you say, man, I did something wrong. What you're doing is agreeing with God. And God says, yep. That's what confession is. Confession is agreeing with God. If you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus, by the way, it doesn't mean just saying his name. It means confessing and agreeing that he's the Lord, which means your life should show it. Well, I, I believe in Jesus. Oh, yeah? Well, why are you beating your wife? Well, she mouthed off to me. Really? I thought you believed in the Lord Jesus. You see, there are people that have a historical reference of who Jesus is, but they have no relational existence with Jesus Christ. That's why people say, well, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah? Well, <laughs> why are you stealing? Why are you, why are you getting high? Why are you doing stupid things? Blatantly stupid things. Good point. Because <laughs> you haven't confessed. Just because you speak it doesn't mean you agree. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's faith. It's not believing in something that's not true. It's believing in something that will be true and is true. In 2 John verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. There's a good memory verse right there. They do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. There are people that believe that he was some kind of an astral projection, that you know God had a projector up there and he just made kind of a that he didn't leave footprints. And there are people that actually have written things and have said this throughout the years in Christianity. Well, if that's true, then he couldn't have been the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for the sins of the world, and it couldn't have been any bloodshed if he didn't have any. And yet, this is, this is where people go when they're tripping on acid or something. I don't know. They just aren't reading the word. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, and being found in appearance as a man, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on the earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And the thing is, you're going to confess now or you're going to confess later? You're going to bow your knee now or you're going to bow your knee later? You're going to agree on this side of eternity or you're going to have to agree on the other side of eternity? And all of eternity hangs in the balance of whether you do or you don't. Jesus gave us a picture of what it is to humble yourself to death, even death on a cross. And as Christians, we do that every day. We die to ourselves and we live for him. I don't do those things that my flesh naturally inclines me to do, like smack somebody who really deserves it. Right? Like cut somebody off who cut me off first. Like somebody's coming up on me from behind at high speed, and I figure, I'll fix this. <laughs> a 
I'm confessing. I agree with God. So, you're going to do it now or you're going to do it later? Verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. That's Isaiah 28, 16. I've inserted that so you know where it's found. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. And aren't you glad? Well, I'm not Jewish, so I can't come to know the Lord. Oh, well, it's not that way. God accepts us not on the basis of who we're related to, but who we know. Between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is over, over all, is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's in Joel 2.32, if you want to get it tattooed on your arm. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You believe that? Yes. Amen. Amen. In Isaiah 28, 16, just so that you see the rest of the passage, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily is the way that it's interpreted. Uh, the, the, the word for act hastily is the word kush. It's actually onomatopoeia. You know what onomatopoeia is? Yeah. Your vocabulary word of the day is onomatopoeia. <laughs> if you've ever watched Batman, the original Batman, all of what they put on the screen when they're beating people up, that's onomatopoeia, okay? <laughs> Boom, pop, crash. You know, where, where the thing actually makes the sound of what the thing is that it's talking about. Sizzle, sizzle. You know, things like that. That's onomatopoeia. Everybody say onomatopoeia. I know, it's English class all over again. So sorry. So the word of acting hastily actually is the word kush, which is the sound of what your feet sound like when you're running. Kush, 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 kush. So if you're going to depend upon the Lord, you're going to trust in the Lord, you won't be running away in panic. And that's essentially what it means. That's the pictorial language of, of Hebrew. Uh, sorry, I just thought I'd give you a little window into my day. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, there's no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. He is the foundation of our faith. He's the foundation of our salvation. He is the foundation of our justification. He is the, the foundation of all of it. It's not like, well, I came to know Jesus and now he's going to be so glad he picked me. <laughs> because that's a completely other law. What it is is, thank you, Jesus, that you love me. How can I love you more? How can I love you back? Just tell me what to do. In Luke 20, verses 17 and 18, Jesus says this to the Pharisees, and he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? And he quotes another Old Testament passage. The stone which the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but whomsoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. You see, you either fall upon Jesus as your Savior in a pleading, help me God, or he will fall on you and you will be ground to powder in judgment. I have fallen upon Jesus Christ. I was drowning in my own selfishness and I came upon the rock and that's what saved me. And it was rejected by men and yet beloved by God, who is Jesus Christ himself. In John 6, 37 to 40, it says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And the one who comes to me, I will no, by no means cast out. I'm wondering, are those two categories or one? Let me read it again. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And... The one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. You can argue about that later. <laughs> All and one. The Father gives, comes to me. Is there room for someone else to get saved? Yes. A 
lots of room. We'll make an overflow room. There is lots of room for people to get saved. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And that should be your statement as well. For this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he's given to me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. He's talking about you. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Notice there isn't, you need to do 75 things or 318 things and I will save you. It's believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. That's it. Which sounds too good to be true. And in this world, a world where people are making promises they never keep, it's really hard to believe, isn't it? That's why it's an act of God. Thank you guys for bearing with me in my I go off in trails. But do you have a deep desire for those who don't know Jesus to know Jesus? Are you confident enough in your salvation that you could tell somebody, listen, I got a free gift and I got to tell you about it? Do you have a passion for souls? We should. And we should use absolute dexterity and care and proficiency and love as we present Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Somebody did in my life one day tell me about Jesus Christ and Jesus changed my life and I am so grateful and I will never forget it, ever. And you know, the Lord never forgets it either. I'm wondering, will the Lord use you even today to share the good news of Jesus Christ with somebody who doesn't know him. Just by simple faith in what Jesus did for you, somebody could be added to the kingdom. Wouldn't that be exciting?